All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Gerta Hojai, and I'm an assistant professor at Children Research Institute uh, at UT Southwestern. I would like to say that this is a great pleasure uh, to be invited at the Metabolism and Physiology meeting in 2021, organized by Philip uh, White and Megara Lab. So thank you again, uh, Philip, for the kind invitation, and it's a great honor to be part of this seminar series. Today, uh, my, title, uh, my talk title is uh, The Role of Cellular Reducing Power in Cell Growth. And I'll be telling you two stories. One story uh, that, uh, that is finalized in Brendan's Manning Lab when I was a postdoc, and a new story from my own laboratory. My lab is very interested in understanding how metabolism is regulated at a molecular level, how metabolism works, and how metabolism uh, is regulated both in physiology, but also in cancer. And it has been long recognized that cancer cells, they have altered metabolism. And this is since the early days of Otto Warburg about a century ago, who made the interesting discovery that cancer cells, they have a high rate of glycolysis and also they increase the, the lactate production. And now we know that this is due to fundamental differences between the normal cells, the metabolism of the normal cells and the metabolism of the cancer cells. A normal cell or a differentiated cells, they generally use catabolic processes to maintain their biomass in the form of lipid, protein, and nucleotides, as well as their energy. While cancer cells, they have a shift into their metabolism towards anabolic processes to generate more biomass, such as lipids, proteins, and nucleotides in order to sustain cell division, as well as maintain their energetic level. But even though metabolism is deregulated in cancer, we, on, we only know of a handful of enzymes that are mutated in cancer. So metabolic enzymes are not frequently mutated. On the other hand, signaling pathways, especially cancer signaling pathway, also comprised of kinase signaling, they are heavily deregulated in cancers and they drive cancer. We have now come to appreciate that cancer signaling, they can also reprogram metabolism, either through direct regulation of metabolic enzymes or through transcriptional regulation of these metabolic enzymes. And my lab is, uh, and since my postdoctoral years and also in my lab, we're very interested in understanding how signaling communicates with metabolism in order to identify key nodes that we can uh, target for cancer. Since my PhD I've, and uh, during my postdoctoral period, I've been really interested in this pathway called the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR1 pathway, which is a pro-growth signaling pathway. Under normal conditions, the PI3 kinase AKT pathway is activated in response to hormones such as insulin, as well as uh, growth factors such as IGF-1. So when insulin or IGF-1 bind to the insulin receptor, they lead to activation of the lipid kinase, PI3 kinase, and also to downstream targets such as AKT and mTORC1. And these kinases, they regulate various aspects of metabolism, they inhibit autophagy, and they support cell growth and proliferation. This pathway is a major oncogenic signaling pathway, and it's very unique because every single node in the pathway, it's either activated or lost in, in cancer. So for example, PI3 kinase, it's one of the most frequently activated oncogenes. AKT and mTOR1 are also known to be aberrantly activated in cancer. P10, it's a tumor suppressor and is the lipid phosphatase, which also is, uh, is commonly lost uh, in cancer. So with that in mind, the, and knowing that this pathway regulates, uh, uh, regulates, metabol uh, regulates metabolism as well as cell growth and proliferation, from a metabolic lens and from a metabolic point of view, uh, cancer cells need to fulfill three basic metabolic requirements in order to proliferate. They need to maintain their bioenergetics in the form of energy or ATP. They need to sustain and increase biosynthesis to produce more nucleotides, amino acids, and lipids in order to divide because every cell division needs to, uh, the cells need to double their biomass. And the cells also need to maintain their redox balance in the form of NADPH, 
which is the currency of, uh, of reducing power. And this will be the topic of what I'll tell you uh, about today. So the first story that I'll tell you is how we identified a new substrate of uh, AKT, which is the metabolic kinase called NAD kinase, that regulates the cell reducing power in the cells and contribute to regulation of metabolism. And before, uh, and before I start, I'd like to give an introduction on the cell reducing power, which will be the topic of, of today's lecture. So cell reducing power, it's stored in the pyridinucleotide cofactors, NADP and NADPH. So as their name suggests, this, these are a class of denucleotides. Basically, they have they contain two uh, nucleotides in their structure, a pyrimidine, a pyridine ring, which is your general vitamin B3 or nicotinamide, and a purine or adenine ring. And by extension, it's its name, nicotinamide adenine denucleotide phosphate. NADP, it's the oxidized form, while NADPH is the reduced form. NADPH is the major currency of cell reducing power, and NADPH is an important cofactor because it donates electron, electrons in order to support reductive biosynthesis, such as lipid synthesis, nucleotide synthesis, and amino acid synthesis. And reductive biosynthesis consumes a lot of NADPH. For example, in order to generate one lipid molecule, uh, such as palmitate, uh, you need about 14 molecules of NADPH to do so. NADPH is also a very important cofactor for antioxidant systems, such as glutathione, and it can be regenerated from NADP through the NADPH producing systems, such as pentose phosphate pathway. And given that, um, that the PI3 kinase AKT pathway and the growth factor signaling, they usually stimulate biosynthetic processes and anabolic metabolism, we ask the questions whether this pathway can also regulate any of the NADP and the NADPH cofactors. So we started off with a very simple experiment in HEC293 cells in which we serum starved the cells and then treated them with insulin over a time course. And we observed that within one hour of insulin stimulation, we see an increase in the NADPH levels. And this was really interesting, but at the same time, we also know that insulin signaling increases glucose uptake, which can increase flux through the pentose phosphate pathway. So this makes sense. At the same time, in parallel, we also looked at NADP level, and we found that similarly to NADPH, insulin also increased the NADP levels. And this was a little bit more surprising because there was no direct connection between NADP uh, cofactors and insulin signaling. Interestingly, the insulin-mediated increase in NADP and NADPH level was completely inhibited when we pretreated the cells with an AKT inhibitor shown in here as MK2206. Moreover, we used different cancer cell lines that lack P10 and have constitutively active AKT signaling. And when we treated the cells with AKT inhibitor for about two hours, we observed a decrease in both NADP and NADPH levels, suggesting that AKT signaling affects NADP and NADPH production. So we hypothesized that at this point that perhaps AKT could be driving the biosynthesis of these cofactors. So in order to test that hypothesis in metabolism, we usually do metabolic tracing. So we label the cells with vitamin B3 or nicotinamide. In this case, nicotinamide is labeled in four positions or it and it's M plus four. So it has three labeled carbons and one nitrogen. Nicotinamide through the NAD salvage pathway can be converted into NAD and the newly synthesized will be M plus four. And through this enzyme called NAD kinase can be converted into NADP M plus four. So to test whether AKT signaling in, uh, increases NADP biosynthesis, we treated, uh, we activated AKT either with IGF-1 or by overexpressing AKT catalytically active, and we performed tracing with nicotinamide. We observed that IGF-1 stimulation resulted in an increase in the novo NADP synthesis, which was completely blocked by AKT inhibitor. Moreover, uh, when we express AKT catalytically active, but uh, we also observe an increase in the novo NADP synthesis, but not when we express AKT catalytically dead. 
So both of these experiments suggest that stimulation of AKT activity increases the novel NADP biosynthesis. And we don't see much of an effect on the NAD levels in the cells. So at this point, we hypothesize that the NAD kinase steps could be regulated by AKT. So just, we, we, just before we go ahead, I want to give a brief introduction about NAD kinase. NAD kinase is a, is a key uh, metabolic enzyme which bridges the two major pillars of the solar reducing power, NAD and NADH, to NADP and NADPH, which is required for anabolic metabolism. And NAD kinase basically phosphorylates NAD to generate NADP, and it's known to determine the solar poles of NADPH levels in the cells. So not much is known about NAD kinase in mammalian cells except for catalyzing this reaction. So we were very curious whether this kinase could be subject to regulation by AKT signaling. So in order to test this, we first look at the sequence of NAD kinase. And we observed that in the n terminus se sequence, we found uh, three overlapping sequences for AGC kinase motif. So AGC kinase motif is a serine or threonine at the first positions, and they are flanked by basophilic residues at minus three or minus five position, shown in here by this arginine or lysine. So there's three overlapping AGC kinase motif sequences, and AKT is, is one of them. So first, we, we wanted to know whether NAD kinase can be phosphorylated in response to AKT. Uh, we were lucky to find the phosphomotive antibody that was able to detect phosphorylation of NADK when we started this project. So we, we serum starved the cells and then treated them with IGF-1 over a time course. We purified flag NADK and with this phosphomotive antibody, we looked at phosphorylation. And as you can uh, appreciate, within seven minutes of IGF-1 treatment, we see a robust phosphorylation of NAD kinase. Interestingly, the IGF-1 mediated phosphorylation of NAD kinase was completely blocked when we treated the cells with this MK compound, which is the AKT inhibitor, but it wasn't blocked when we treat them with rapamycin, the mTORC1 inhibitor, suggesting that we're, we're seeing an AKT mediated phosphorylation event. So to map these phosphorylation sites, which we predicted that they can be phosphorylated, we actually performed phosphomapping. So we expressed NAD kinase together with AKT catalytically active or AKT kinase dead. We purified and sent it to mass spec. And the mass spectrometry identified three sites, serine 44, serine 46, and serine 48 shown in here. But the two major sites that we found was serine 44 and serine 46. So to confirm whether NAD kinase was a de facto substrate of AKT, we performed an in vitro assay with AKT. So we purified NADK from, uh, by, uh, from, uh, from E. coli. We purified either the wild type form or different mutants, serine 44 to alanine, serine 46 to alanine, the double mutant, serine 48 alone, as well as the triple mutant. And we, we did an in vitro reaction either for five minutes until 30 minutes. And this was done in the presence of P32. Interestingly, within five minutes of incubation of NAD kinase together with AKT, we can see a robust phosphorylation of NAD kinase in response to AKT, shown in here in the wild type enzymes. If we look by 30 minutes, again, we observe the same phosphorylation, but we can also observe that mutation of serum 44 alone and serum 46 alone does not abolish, abolish phosphorylation of NAD kinase. However, the double mutant serine 44 and serine 46 completely abolishes uh, the phosphorylation of NADK by AKT, suggesting that these two are the two major sites uh, of AKT. So it's serine 44 and serine 46, and to a lesser extent is serine 48. In collaboration with cell signaling technology, we generated a phosphospecific antibody which uh, is able to recognize primarily serine 44, but also serine 46. And with this antibody, now we can detect endogenous phosphorylation of NADK. And as you might appreciate, we see that IGF-1 uh, increases phosphorylation of NADK, both in HEC-293 cells and these maps, which is completely blocked by pretreatment with 
MK226 DAG-T inhibitor, but not pretreatment with rapamycin. So this data, it's in line with the data that we, show, that we previously shown uh, through overexpression experiments with NAD kinase. And while this is important we're, uh, that we can show the endogenous phosphorylation in vitro in cell culture, we were also able to see phosphorylation of, of NAD kinase in vivo after physiological conditions such as fasting and, and feeding in white adipose tissue. So we see a robust phosphorylation of NADK at these two sites in vivo as well. So all this data together demonstrates that NAD kinase, it's a substrate, it's a direct substrate of AKT. However, the question remains, are these phosphorylation sites important uh, in biology and what is the role of these phosphorylation sites? So to answer that question, we uh, created a system in which we have a stable knockdown of NAD kinase, and then we can restore, we can rescue NADK either by, uh, by giving wild-type NADK or this phosphodeficient mutant, which uh, we decided to go with a, a 3A mutant. So it's serine 44, 46, and 48. In this system, we will treat the cells with IGF-1 or a KT catalytically active, and again, perform a nicotinamide tracing experiment to look at the novo synthesis of NADP. In such a system, we observe that IGF-1 treatment in the wild type cells has the ability to increase the de novo synthesis of NADP. However, we see that the phosphodeficient mutants fail to, do, to increase the NADP biosynthesis as these phosphorylation sites are not, when these phosphorylation sites are, are not there anymore. Similarly, we observed that uh, expression of AKT catalytically active, but expression of AKT catalytically active also has the ability to increase NADP uh, biosynthesis in the wild type cells, but not in the phosphodeficient cells, suggesting that this AKT mediated phosphorylation sites, this serve to boost the activity of NAD kinase. And I also want to emphasize that in this case, at least for NADK, this is not an on or off switch. This is more of a tuning mechanism because the phosphodeficient mutants, they are not defected at their basal activity. It's just the ability of AKT or, or IGF-1 to increase uh, the NADP biosynthesis that is being hindered with these phosphodeficient mutants. Recently, uh, there was, uh, there was, in the literature, uh, a, a very interesting paper came out identified uh, an activating mutation of NAD kinase in pancreatic cancer, in PDAC. This mutation, it's uh, I90F, it's in the N-terminus region of NAD kinase. It increased the NAD kinase activity as well as it decreased, sur uh, it decreased survival in the animals and it increased tumorogenesis. So after this paper, we thought that perhaps this N-terminus region uh, where these phosphorylation sites are and where these activating mutations are, maybe perhaps this is some sort of regulatory uh, domain. So interestingly, through looking at different databases, we also came across a natural form of NED kinase, which is called isoform 3, that completely lacks these N-terminus regions when, where these phosphorylation sites reside. We were very curious about its activity, so we purified the isoform 3, and we also used isoform 1 that has deleted N-terminus region, and we purified and tested its activity. Interestingly, we observed that both isoform 3 and DLNAD, and DLNAD kinase, shown here in green and in red, they had higher catalytic activity. And this was really interesting. Um, and this catalytic activity was observed in vitro, so we were very curious to see what will happen if we put this mutant NAD kinases in the cells. And again, uh, similar to the in vitro kinase activity, we observed that expression of isoform 3 or the deletion of this N-terminus domain of NAD kinase showed, uh, showed a massive increase in NADP production in the cells compared to isoform 1. So these forms of NAD kinase are constitutively active and they don't respond anymore to AKT catalytically active because they actually don't have these phosphorylation sites um, compared to isoform 1. So our data suggests that the N-terminus region of NAD kinase serves to inhibit the kinase domain of NADK. 
But what's the biological effect of these phosphorylation sites and what's the biological effect of, of NADK? As, so we were very surprised to see, and we've done this in multiple different cell systems, that when we knock out or when we knock down any kinase, we observe very little effect on 2D cell proliferation. Uh, and uh, similarly, also these phosphodeficient mutants, they also had very little effect on cell proliferation. However, we found that when we lose NAD kinase, we see uh, a profound effect on colony formation in soft agar. So loss of NADK no longer uh, allows for colony formation in soft agar, and we can restore this by uh, putting back NAD kinase wild type, uh, and while the phosphodeficient mutant decreased the capacity for colony formation in soft agar, suggesting perhaps that these phosphorylation sites could be important during tumorogenesis. And uh, this, to summarize the story, basically we identified a new substrate of AKT, this NAD kinase, uh, where, uh, where we think that, uh, which is a new link between signaling and metabolism. We think that, um, that NADK is part of an anabolic program regulated by the TI3 kinase AKT mTOR1 pathway, in which AKT signaling, in addition to increasing glucose uptake, as well as increasing flux through the glycolysis by phosphorylating other targets, it also phosphorylates and stimulates the activity of NAD kinase to increase NADP production and to support reductive biosynthesis for cell growth and proliferation. So this was um, uh, th this was one of the last pieces of work that I did uh, during my uh, postdoctoral period, which got me very interested uh, into th this uh, redox metabolism and into the redox space. So when I started my lab, I was very interested in understanding NADP and NADPH metabolism at, uh, at subcellular resolution. So uh, as I told you today, uh, NAD kinase is the cytosolic form uh, that maintains the NADP and NADPH levels in the cytosol to support biosynthesis, uh, as well to support mainly biosynthesis, it is um, mainly biosynthesis. While in mitochondria, there is another, uh, another NAD kinase called NAD kinase 2, which does the same reaction. It phosphorylates NAD to generate NADP and NADPH, and the primary role of NAD K2, as well as mitochondrial NADPH, it is thought to fight ROS. So uh, when I started my lab, I was very interested in, under in, in addition to understanding the role of NAD kinase, to also understand the role of mitochondrial NAD K2. So we started off very simply. So we generated knockout of NAD K2 via CRISPR in many different cell lines shown in here in six different cells of different origins in HECTO-93, KILAS, K562, uh, A5490, 47D, and 8375. Um, so in all these different cells, loss of NADK2 showed a drastic effect on cell proliferation. And in a way, that this makes a lot of sense because we're knocking down a gene which is really critical uh, for to maintain mitochondrial NADPH. But at the same time, this was a little bit surprising to me because we were studying uh, we were studying cytosolic um, NAD kinase, which seemed to have no effect on cell proliferation at all. So, but in fact, it was important for encouraging dependent cell growth. So coming back to the function of NADK2, we were very curious whether we can, uh, when, whether we can uh, rescue uh, the NADK2 knockout cells, perhaps with metabolic intermediates that depend on NADPH. So that's what we did. We took these NADK2 deficient cells and they gave, gave them um, a bunch of supplements that are thought to depend on NADPH. We gave the cells uh, N-acetylcysteine or NAC in order to uh, fight ROS, we gave them nucleotide, nucleosides or nucleobases to replenish their nucleotide content, uh, non-essential amino acids, as well as pyruvate and aspartate to support uh, mitochondrial metabolism. And out of all of these different agents, we found that only addition of non-essential amino acids was able to completely rescue the proliferation of NADK2 deficient cells. And this was, we were very curious about these results and very excited about it. So uh, 
we decided to test which of these non-essential amino acids is able to restore cell proliferation. So there are seven different non-essential amino acids and we gave them individually to the cells. And out of uh, all of these non-essential amino acids shown in here, we found that addition of protein alone was able to completely restore cell proliferation of any DK2 knockout cells shown here in black. So this was really cool. However, uh, this was a very surprising result and that's because when we purify the mitochondria of, uh, of NADK2 deficient cells shown in this condition in here, in the second condition, using a method that was developed in David Sabatini's lab, uh, this uh, MitoIP, we actually found that the, that the mitochondrial content of NADP and NADPH in NADK2 deficient cells, it's very, very low to almost absent. And this is completely restored when we have NADK2. So this data suggests that somehow, even though the mitochondria have very little content in NADP and NADPH, protein has the ability to, to circumvent the requirement for mitochondrial NADPH uh, for cell growth. So with this data, uh, we went back to metabolomics to see whether we can get an insight of why uh, NADK2 uh, deleted cells, they, uh, they are dependent on protein. So we used an isogenic system. Uh, in here, it's shown in HECTO-93 cells, which um, uh, in HECTO-93 cells that are deficient of an, ED, of an EDK2 or are deficient of an EDK2 and express back an EDK2. And metabolic profiling showed that proline is the most significantly altered metabolite. So we, we decided to get a closer look into proline metabolism. And proline metabolism happens predominantly in the mitochondria and you can, proline is a non-essential amino acid. So what that means is that we can, we, we don't need to take proline from the environment and uh, the cells of our body can make it. And proline metabolism uh, and proline biosynthesis can happen in mitochondria through, through conversion uh, of glutamine into glutamate. And then glutamate is then converted in two step reaction into proline. And as you might appreciate, both of these enzymes, P5CS is an NADPH requiring enzyme, while the PYCR1 has been reported to use both NADPH and NADH. However, our data suggests that this can run on NADH. So based on the schematic shown in here, we hypothesize that uh, NADK2, which produces mitochondrial NADP and um, maintains NADPH levels could be required for proline biosynthesis to fuel NADPH production and to run this, this process. So we decided to test this empirically. We labeled the cells with heavy labeled glutamine, which is labeled at five position with this five carbon and glutamine conversion into glutamate afterwards uh, through conversion uh, through the P5CS and PYCR1 will be converted into proline and all these carbons will be retained. So the newly synthesized proline will have a mass of M plus five that we can detect by mass spectrometry. So we decided to test this hypothesis. So again, we used isogenic system. Um, here it's shown in HECTO-93 cells where we have wild type cells, we have knockout NADK2 and we restore NADK2 by adding back NADK2. We performed glutamine tracing for three hours and we observed that within three hours, uh, we can see, a, we, we can observe about 60% of fractional enrichment of proline in the wild type cells. While in the knockout cells, we essentially see, elimin uh, we essentially see no, pro no newly synthesized proline. And this is completely restored when we give back NADK2. Um, we also observed that the levels of glutamine and glutamate are uh, marginally affected. And our data suggests that NADK2 seems to be uh, essential and it's required for proline synthesis. We've reproduced this data in many different cell system and it's always the same result. So here is shown in HILAS. Again, if you have no, in knockouts, uh, NADK2 knockout cells, we don't see any proline biosynthesis, no newly synthesized uh, proline, which can of course be restored by NADK2. Moreover, uh, we were also very lucky to get some patient fibroblasts, fibroblasts 
uh, that are NADK2 deficient. And also in this patient fibroblast shown in here, we essentially see no prolin biosynthesis, again, confirming and suggesting that NADK2 is absolutely required for prolin synthesis. But given that NAD kinase 2 uh, is a metabolic enzyme and it has catalytic activity, we asked the question whether the catalytic activity was required for, for proline synthesis. So NAD kinases, they have this, uh, they have a, a, a catalytic motive, which is this uh, glycine glycine and then aspartic acid followed by glycine. So we mutated this catalytic residue, the aspartic acid into alanine, and then reconstituted NADK2 knockout cells either with an empty vector, with wild-type NADK2, as well as with catalytically dead NADK2. And we made sure that the levels of the wild-type and the catalytically dead NADK2 were the same. We then uh, measured proline levels um, after gl glutamine tracing. And again, we see that the loss of NAD kinase 2, the uh, loss of NAD kinase 2 decreased proline biosynthesis, which can be restored by the wild type, but not the catalytically dead NADK2. Again, um, confirming that it's the catalytic activity of NADK2 that is required for proline biosynthesis. And um, while we're very happy with the data so far, the question still remains of how does proline supplementation rescue cell proliferation in NADK2 knockout cells when we know that NADPH can be used for many, many other processes and somehow just one single metabolite is sufficient to bring uh, uh, to to restore uh, to restore cell cell growth and proliferation. So we looked in the literature and we found that proline, in addition to being an amino acid and be used for pro, uh, for protein synthesis, it has also been implicated in other processes, uh, both in ROS but. Uh, and also in bioenergetics in stimulating ATP. So we decided to test all these different processes that, uh, that proline has been implicated one by one. So first we started with ROS and uh, we measured ROS levels in NADK2 deficient cells shown here in the black bars or in NADK2 deficient cells that have been reconstituted with NADK2. And we found that both in HeLa cells and HEC293 cells, we do observe an increase in ROS levels if NADK2 is lost, but proline had no effect on ROS levels. So it's not influencing the ROS. Then we tested whether proline could be affecting the, uh, the, um, the solar respiration. We measured uh, oxygen consumption rate, uh, rate by a seahorse. And again, we observed that loss of NADK2 uh, showed the decrease um, in OCR, which was completely restored by NADK2. And we've seen this in multiple different cell systems uh, that while NADK2 has an effect on bioenergetics, proline addition has no effect. So we don't see an effect of proline either on redox or bioenergetics. And given that most of our phenotypes are, are related to cell proliferation, we decided to look a little bit more closely at cell cycle. So to do that, we synchronized the cells in G1 by a double thymidine block. And, um, and after that, we released the, this NADK2 deficient cells either in the presence or absence of proline, showing these two graphs in here. And within four hours of, uh, of uh, removing the thymidine blockade, we observed that, uh, that while the NADK2 deficient cells are about 50% still in G1, in the presence of proline, most of the cells are in, 90% of the cells are in S phase or they have passed through the S phase and they are now in G2M. So this suggested to us that there's a general delay in, uh, in cell cycle in an NADK2 deficient cells that this can be restored by proline. So one of our hypotheses was that, well, perhaps proline could be limiting for protein synthesis, but perhaps also for nucleotide synthesis uh, for nucleotide synthesis. So we decided to, uh, we decided to look into these processes. First, we tested whether proline availability might affect nucleotide biosynthesis. So to do that, we performed a glucose tracing experiment. So we gave cells fully labeled glucose, which is labeled um, in, in all of the six carbons. And we can trace these different carbons into the ribose 5-phosphate and then into PRPP, phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate, which is the activated sugar that can be traced in both pyrimidines as well as, uh, as, well as purine levels. 
So again, we tested whether protein or NADK2 uh, are important for nucleotide biosynthesis. So interestingly, we observed that NADK2 deficient cells, uh, they have lower de novo purine as well as pyrimidine synthesis. So purines shown in here by AMP and GMP and pyrimidines by CMP and UDP labeling at M plus five. And when we give cells back NADK2 shown in this white bar, or when we give them back proline, we observe that both of them completely restored nucleotide biosynthesis. So this data suggests that somehow proline is limiting for nucleotide biosynthesis in NADK2 deficient cells. And while this is very interesting, there is no direct connection between proline, which is an amino acid, and nucleotide biosynthesis. So we decided to look a little bit more closely into this, and we profiled many, many genes um, that are involved in nucleotide biosynthesis in three, um, in three or four different cell lines, two shown in here. And among all of, of this analysis, we found that PRPS1 and PRPS2, which are the two genes that produce this activated sugar, PRPP, they are, influ they are influenced by both proline availability as well as NADK2 levels. Other genes that we found to be regulated in the same manner are the purine salvage enzymes, APRT and HPRT, as well as uh, CAD, which is a de novo pyrimidine synthesis enzymes. While, um, while other genes in the pentose phosphate pathways and other uh, purine synthesis enzymes, they didn't seem to be affected. Similar to, the, uh, to this analysis, in, uh, to the protein, and, uh, protein level analysis, we also performed a transcript level analysis of these different genes, and we observed the same thing. The same genes that were regulated at the protein levels seem to also be regulated by proline and NADK2 at the transcript level. So this data suggests that there might be a gene signature that is regulated by proline availability as well as an NDK2, uh, as well as an NDK2. But currently, we're working into this to 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 uh, to bet. We're working into identifying whether there's a uh, there's a special transcription factor that uh, that regulates uh, these genes. So in parallel, we also tested whether an NDK2 regulates protein synthesis, and as one might expect. Uh, we don't have uh, NADK2 deficient cells, they produce very little proline, so we do see a, re a reduction in protein synthesis shown here in this black bar, uh, in this blue bar, which is completely restored when we add back proline or when we add back uh, NADK2, suggesting that NADK2 uh, indeed uh, inhibits protein synthesis. And since we have a system in which uh, we have a system in which we can modulate the proline levels in the cells, we decided to ask the question, and we're very curious about um, whether the proline levels in the cells can be sensed by major amino acid sensing pathways, such as mTOR1 pathway or the GCN2 pathway. So we did um, a simple experiment with Uchila cells which are isogenic, so they are either deficient of, on uh, NADK2 or, they, or where we express back NADK2, and we performed the proline dropout experiment. And as you might appreciate, within uh, one hour or two hours of proline dropout in NADK2 deficient cells, we can see uh, a, an immediate response in phosphorylation of GCN2, as well as downstream targets such as uh, EIF2-alpha and an elevation of ATF4. However, within 12 hours of proline dropout, we don't see a major effect on mTOR1 signaling, suggesting that, uh, that uh, proline depletion and then NDK2 loss has an, triggers the immediate activation of the GCN2 EIF2 alpha ITF4 uh, signaling, but not mTOR1 signaling. We do see a decrease in mTOR1 signaling, but that's at later uh, time points after 48 hours. So in summary, we identified an essential role for mitochondrial NADP and NADPH, and that is to enable proline biosynthesis for cell growth. We found that proline is, a, is important for both protein synthesis, but it's also limiting uh, and key for nucleotide biosynthesis, and these processes support cell growth. Thus, we have identified we have also uh, identified the first example of proline. Ox oxotropy in mammalian cells, which is completely dependent on NADK2 activity and mitochondrial NADPH. 
Uh, this uh, story was recently published in Nature Metabolism, and similar results have also been, um, been reported by Craig Thompson Labs uh, at the same time as, as this paper came out. In the lab, we're very interested in uh, cancer metabolism and, and uh, tumor metabolism. So we asked the question whether this NADK2 proline axis could also be important for tumor growth. So again, in here, we have an isogenic setting where we have loss of NADK2 and we're, we reconstitute the cells back with NADK2 in this lung cancer derived cell line, A549, as well as this leukemia cell line, K562. And in both systems, we observe that NADK2 loss decreases uh, tumor growth. Interestingly, when we looked at the metabolites within these tumors, we also observed that the proline levels within the tumors are lower in NADK2 deficient cells shown here in the blue bars compared to NADK2 expressing cells. And that suggests to us that NADK2 is in fact required to maintain proline levels within the tumor and that circulatory, uh, circulatory proline is not sufficient to maintain proline levels. So we're in the lab, we're very much interested in uh, carrying on our work on NAD kinases, and we're very interested in understanding both NADK, the role of NADK2 and NADK in physiology and in cancer. So we have generated flux mice, and we're, we're going to continue uh, uh, our, our work uh, in vivo from here on. So with this, I would like uh, to thank um, uh, my lab, uh, the NADK2 project, has been uh, carried by two talented postdocs in the lab, Dim and Rushi, uh, which uh, work relentlessly, even through pandemic uh, uh, in this project. They were assisted by Mona and Haley in the lab. We had a great collaboration with Brad de Berardini's lab and his lamp members, and we have a fantastic mass spectrometry core. Uh, I would also like to thank my postdoc mentor, Brendan Manning at Harvard School of Public Health uh, for his mentorship during my postdoc, as well as Isam Ben Sara, who now has his lab in, uh, in Chicago and he was in Brendan's lab, who also contributed a lot to the NADK story. And with that, I'd also um, wanna thank the, the great environment uh, that we have at CRI. Uh, here and of course all of you for listening and and Philip for the again for the kind uh, invitation to give this talk today. <laughs>